This is going to be Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're going to talk about evil men among us. We are living in a time when men are so wicked and without feeling that it's almost as if they aren't even human. It's like something you'd see on a movie. And while going through Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I started thinking about some of the characteristics of these evil men that we're seeing everywhere today. Men who are past feeling, men who are so cold and, and heartless, and it's like it's going to be in the tribulation. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's the way people are going to be in the tribulation. There's going to be so much iniquity that the love of many is going to wax cold. But these evil men, they have some characteristics. And let's point out some of their characteristics here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Number one, they major in oppressing. Solomon says in verse 1 in Ecclesiastes 4, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. So he comes back and thinks about all the oppressions that are done under the sun. All over the world, people are being oppressed. No matter where you go, in America, any country, there's people being oppressed. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. They're, they're crying, they're in misery and pain all over the world. And they had no comforter. The majority of people are lost and there's no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Today, you hear a lot of talk about oppression. And what I believe personally is small children of any race are seeing more oppression than anyone. It's not a certain race that's getting oppressed. It's the children. Millions of them are being raped and tortured at any given moment by wicked oppressors. These are filthy men with a defiled conscience. Uh, their conscience ends up being seared with a hot iron to the point they don't care what they do. They don't care who they hurt. Your, your conscience has to be so corrupted to be able to do the things to small children like these men do. Solomon says, Behold the tears of such as were oppressed. Right now, while I'm talking, there are little kids crying, wanting their mommy and daddy, but some sick pedophile freak took them away. And these children, they have no comforter. There are people in this world all over it that have no comforter. God is allowing these things to happen. God is allowing these things to happen every day, every hour, every second. So you mean to tell me you think he won't let you burn in hell for rejecting Jesus Christ that went through agony on the cross to die for you? He will let you burn in hell. Look at all the pain and misery that he's allowing people to go through in this world. He will let you die and go to hell. He's, wa he's already watched 6,000 years of pain and suffering. He'll let you burn in hell. You better get saved. You may go through something like this yourself in this life. But there's a difference between you going through it and a lost person going through it. If you're saved, you do have a comforter. In John 15, 26, it says, But when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And 2 Thessalonians 2.16 says, And our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. God gives us everlasting consolation if you're saved. And if you sit around and think about all the oppressions going on today, you wouldn't be able to enjoy anything in life. Because that's what's going on. Horrible things under the sun. In James 2, 6, it says, Do not rich men oppress you. Now that's heavy for the tribulation. But you also see it today. The rich men want depopulation. The rich men aren't satisfied with riches, so they are doing illegal things, cruel things, evil things. And this is all for the love of money. In 1 Timothy 6, 10, it says, For the love of money 
is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For money, a man would kill his own family if he loves money. If a man loves money so much, he can sell out his own country. If a man loves money and he's so wicked, he could sell small children. Just like you see these rich men doing today. It's the rich men that are buying and selling children. It's not the average ordinary people like me and you. It's the rich men. You know, how do we know it's the rich men? These ri Like, everybody sees these rich people as these people are civilized because they got money, they got nice clothes, they got a nice car. It's the rich men that have the money to buy the small children. It's the rich men that have the money because they're selling the children. For a, it's, it's a money-making racket. And that's why they're doing it. The love of money is the root of all evil. And that's why today the most oppressed people are small children and Christians. The evil men among us, major and oppressing. They have power because of their money and fame. And the victims of these oppressors are crying. But if they aren't saved, they have no comforter. So that's the first thing. These evil men among us, they major in oppressing. And next, evil men make death seem sweet. In Ecclesiastes 4.2 it says, Wherefore I praise the dead, but you're already dead, more than the living which are yet alive. Solomon says this because the ones who are dead have escaped this jungle that we're living in. Lester Roloff said, America is an insane asylum run by the inmates. So what would he think now if he saw what was going on? What would he think about who's running this thing now? Paul called this a present evil world. What would he think if he saw it right now? Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So if there was no heaven or God to lean on, then we would be better off dead. The dead man is better off than the one living and the one who isn't born yet. The one who is making his exit from this world has already made it through the pains of life and the newborn is just entering into it. That's the difference. And those who haven't been born have no idea about the sorrow and wickedness of the world. Little babies don't even realize the wickedness of this world yet. It's a rough road ahead. I have two kids and I think about the world that my kids will have to grow up in if time lasts. And these men in charge have no morals. They are literally godless. Even though they may believe in multiple gods, they have reached new levels of ignorance and stupidity and wickedness. They pray to a god that they made up in their mind. And they also only pray to this false god for a show many times. It's all a show. It's all fake. It's all a lie. They end their prayers with a men and a women. Even though the word amen has nothing to do with gender. I guess at church we need to quit singing hymns and start calling them hers. You know, we don't want to offend the women. So we got to do idiotic things like that. That's how this world is going. It's like something you would see on a movie. Can people really be this stupid? Can people in leadership really be this stupid? Uh, this wicked world makes death seem sweet. They major in oppressing to the point that they make death seem sweet. When you look around and see the corruption and perversion, it does something on the inside to a Christian. In 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, For that righteous man dwelling among them, talking about, talking about Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. When I see these morons on the news which I don't watch the news. I may just read an article about it or something. Or I see the morons in the music industry, in the movie industry. It does something inside. It vexes you. from it, You're vexed from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Every day you get up and it's just, what kind of world are we living in? Men are living for the purpose of fulfilling their own sinful lust and desires. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1.23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire 
to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. This world makes death seem sweet because you're wanting to get out of it. These evil men among us, major and oppressing, they make death seem sweet. And next, they maintain evil works. As Christians, we are supposed to maintain good works. Titus 3.14 says, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. These evil men in this world maintain evil works. Philippians 3.2 says, Beware of evil workers. Micah 2.1 says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Remember, it's on the side of the oppressors there's power. And these people, they sit around tables with each other, with the other big shots, with other elite. They devise iniquity. They think about when they go to bed at night, what evil can they do? What we have among us are workers of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's the spirit of Antichrist is already working in people. They're paving the way for the Antichrist. They are forerunners for the Antichrist. The same way John the Baptist helped be a forerunner for Jesus, these people are forerunners for the man of sin. Their hypocrisy is disgusting. They call evil good. They call good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They are evil workers. But what kind of work do we need to do? Look at verse 4 in Ecclesiastes 4. Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. So we need to do right work, good, honest, hard work, not doing things by fraud and lying and cheating and stealing like these evil men among us do. Even if you go to work and do what you're supposed to do, though, even if you do that, you're going to be envied by someone who doesn't want to do anything. So they will talk bad about you because they are jealous. If you do right works, you'll be envied of your neighbor. For this, a man is envied of his neighbor. That's why it's vanity. It's all vanity. There was a devil-possessed religious woman who was disgusted by the Bible verse magnets and things on my car. And she said, they were silly. I mean, what's silly about it? Everyone else has stickers of everything else on their car. Why can't I put a Bible verse magnet on my car? She was under conviction and jealous because of the magnets. She was supposed to be more religious than me in her mind. So in her mind, she's thinking, well, I'm more religious than him, and he's got those magnets on his car. So immediately, she gets jealous. She begins to insult me. Uh, Pilate knew in Matthew 27, 18 that Jesus was delivered for envy. People will deliver you for envy. People will sell you out for envy. People will see you doing good. It puts them under conviction because they know they need to be doing good. For every right work, a man is envied. You are envied for doing a right thing. If you did an evil work, they wouldn't care as much. But then they'd just call you a hypocrite if you're a Christian. Even though that they are the biggest hypocrite of them all. The evil men among us, major and oppressing, they make death seem sweet. They maintain these evil works. And next, they motivate the lazy man to stay lazy. Ecclesiastes 4, 5 says, The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. The fool is lazy. He folds his hands together and it ain't to pray. It's to sit back and be a sloth. It's to sit back and play fortnight. He has his hands folded together and he just watches everybody else work. He is so lazy that he will start withering away to nothing. He eateth his own flesh. Nowadays, the lazier people get in this country, sometimes the fatter they get. And evil men motivate them to be lazy by keeping them up while they are being lazy. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. But Ecclesiastes 4.5 says, The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. He would eat himself before he'll work. He will eat his wife before he'd go to work. The husband and wife are one flesh. 
The average man doesn't have enough manhood to take care of his own flesh, which includes his wife. I would hate to be on a deserted island with this p kind of person. He wouldn't help me collect any coconuts. He wouldn't help me catch any fish. He would tr try to steal my fish and then eat me. And the Bible talks about cannibalism. A person could be so lazy that they'll get that messed up in their mind. Isaiah 9, 20. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. And he shall eat on the left hand and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Now, every born again believer is part of the same body. We are all members one of another. And yet, they bite and devour one another like a cannibal. If your brother or sister is part of the same body as you, and you're running your mouth about them, spiritually speaking, you're... You're eating your own flesh. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. The lazy Christian sits back and watches other Christians work, criticizing them and biting and devouring them. The evil men of this world encourage the lazy man to be lazy. The motive, they motivate the lazy man to stay lazy because they want the people to be dependent on them. If you're lazy and you can't make a living for yourself, you're going to rely on these oppressors. These evil men, they motivate the lazy man. And they next me measure success by earthly treasures. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says, Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. It would be better to have half of what everyone else has got because the more you have, the more problems you have. The more you have, the more baggage you have to carry. I seen a homeless guy pushing his cart up a hill, and it was killing him. He had more clothes in that cart than I've got in my closet. The more stuff he gets to put in his cart, the harder it gets for him to push it around and to get up that hill. The other homeless guy may not have as many clothes, but that hill don't look as bad to him. And he's not going to bed at night worrying about the other homeless people still in his clothes. The clothes are on him. The more you get, the more you got to worry about. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 says, Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Because it's all so pointless. Have you ever drove by a house and seen Christmas or Halloween dec decorations and you think to yourself for a moment, what's even the point of all this? You're just going to have to take it back down here in a month or two. Or have you ever been mowing the yard and you're really trying to do good and, and make it look good and you think to yourself, why am I spending so much time on this? It's going to be grown back up in a couple of days. To me, taking so much care of my lawn is almost one of the most vain things I can even think of. It just grows back up so fast. I mean, you could dedicate your whole life to making your lawn look good to make it look better than your neighbor's yard, and then you get sick for two weeks, and it looks terrible when you get to mow it again. And all that work you did was just, it's just, it's just all so pointless. The evil men measure success by worldly treasure, treasures. But the world is so pointless. The worldly treasures are pointless. They can't do anything for you. 1 Timothy 6, 5 talks about men that suppose gain is godliness, and prosperity preachers do that. These evil men... See the poor people of this world as cattle. They measure success by worldly riches. These evil men among us have their missiles aimed at the family. Their missiles are aimed at the family. They want rid of the family. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and to bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. So Solomon says, Here there is one alone. The evil man would rather have you alone. He would rather have you choosing to live a life of fornication than to have a godly marriage. Because a family is strong. So the evil man promotes feminism. To make the woman impossible to live with. He promotes men who are effeminate and lazy. So the man is impossible to live with. And it becomes impossible for him to lead. 
Uh, the evil man promotes homosexuality because it goes against the husband and wife relationship with children in a good balanced home. The evil man promotes abortion because his missiles are aimed at the family. He doesn't want there to be a lot of people. He wants population control. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor? And bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. It's good to have other people in your life. Even some Bible believers are loners. They study all day and never pass on what they learn to anybody else. But Solomon says here, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? For whom do you labor in the word and doctrine? Is it just for yourself or do you share what you get with others? For whom are you bereaving your soul of good? If a man is alone, then everything he does is usually for himself. And I know men who don't want the responsibility of a wife or kids. They don't have a wife to come home to or children to look after. Yet they keep going to work and they can't get satisfied with riches. Proverbs 27.20 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. They couldn't be satisfied with one wife, so evil men convince them the bachelor life is better. A life where you can get off work and go drink and fornicate and hang out with the guys with no responsibilities whatsoever. This is what the evil man wants to convince you is the best life you can live. But Ecclesiastes 4.9 says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Your wife may not have a full-time job outside of the home, but she is still doing work at home, making your life easier, which in turn makes your job easier because you'll be more rested. But the evil man does not like for the man to go to work and the wife to stay at home. The devil likes for the woman to go to work at the factory around other men and away from her husband, especially on different shifts. But the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So everybody needs somebody even if at times we don't feel like we do. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Solomon says in verse 11, Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? So the best thing for the average man to do is get married, unless he has a gift like Paul has, where he doesn't have to get married. But the, ver the verse says, If you have someone to lie with, then you have heat. But how can you be warm alone? Well, the closest the average unmarried man gets to being warm alone is burning in his lust, which isn't a good thing. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Verse 8 of the same chapter in 1 Corinthians 7, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry then to burn. Now verse 12, Ecclesiastes 4.12, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So there is strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Matthew 18.20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You're stronger with other people. The devil wants to divide and conquer. Evil men want to divide and conquer. They want to get groups of people fighting against each other. They want a certain race fighting against another race. They want everybody to be fighting because then you split up. They divide and conquer. Ecclesiastes 4.13 Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. As a general rule older people are wiser but there are times when a child is wiser than an adult there are times when a child is wiser than his own parents a young child who is saved and believes in god is better off than a rich president who doesn't even retain god in his knowledge an old foolish king who will no longer be admonished is in very rough shape 
If he won't be admonished, admonished, then this means he's unteachable. It's hard to teach someone who thinks they already know everything. This is a common trait of young people. However, you will find older people who think they know everything. And you don't want to get to a point where you can't learn. Every person knows something that you don't know. Every person can become your teacher in a sense. Because they all know something that you don't. But the evil man... He's got his missiles aimed at the family. He doesn't want you to have a strong family. He doesn't want a godly man leading the home with a godly woman keeping, being a keeper at home with children in subjection to the parents. That's something that the evil man doesn't want. That's why children are taught to be rebellious from a very early age. That's why women are taught that being a keeper at home means you're lazy or means, you know, you're a doormat. And that's why men are tempted by billboards and magazines and TV shows and everything else to love every other person's wife other than their own. The evil man doesn't want you to have a strong family. He doesn't want a strong home because their missiles are aimed at the family. And next, their morals get worse as they age. The average person will get more conservative with age. The average person will go through things in their life that will humble them. But a gray-headed liberal is a wicked person. Because, I mean, man in general is evil. Our flesh is bad. But if you're old and you've been through some things and you're still a liberal you're still godless, you're still without any morals, you're on another level of wicked. If you're in your 70s and you're still a liberal, you still have, you're so ungodly, you've, you're a wicked person because you've been through all kinds of things that should have humbled you and you just got thicker skin to the, you know, the, the things that God was putting in your path to humble you. But Ecclesiastes 4.13 says, Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. You would be better off to be a poor little kid with some sense than an old, foolish, perverted president with no morals. You would be better off to be a kid who would take some instruction than to be an old man who thinks he already knows everything when you actually don't know anything. The devil himself is an old and foolish king. God used him way back and when he was Lucifer to be king over both kingdoms but he blew it he was an old and foolish king who would no more be admonished and Ecclesiastes 4.14 says for out of prison he cometh to reign whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor this is a tough verse I'm, I'm not sure what it is referring to but it, it personally reminds me of the end of the millennium when the devil comes out of prison in an attempt to reign. The old and foolish king still thinks he can reach the top in God's game of thrones, but he cannot. Revelation 27 through 8 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Ecclesiastes 4.14, For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. Those in alliance with the devil would become poor, just like the rich man in Luke 16 went from rich to poor. Now, I'm not saying this is what the interpretation of the verse is, but it reminds me of that. But their morals get worse with age if they don't find God. You ever notice how a lot of preachers many times will get more soft and more compromising with age sometimes? Imagine if they didn't have God at all in their lives. The evil man doesn't have God in his life. And these evil men, their morals decrease with age. They just get further and further away from God. Their conscience gets worse. And their morals just go down the drain. And next... These evil men have a master plan to depopulate the planet. Ecclesiastes 4, 15 and 16, I considered all the living which 
walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people. Even of all that have been before them, they also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Notice it says, there is no end of all the people. There are so many people walking around, you can't even count them. I mean, when you drive down the interstate and you see a traffic jam on the other side, think about all those people you're passing. You have no idea who they are. You know, you have no idea where they came from. Uh, do you ever sit and think about how there are so many people that you don't even know exist? I mean, Bible believers are a very, very small amount of people. And yet there are great Bible believing people that don't even know about another great Bible believer. This even causes them to think they're alone. Elijah thought he was alone, but there were 7,000 other godly people he didn't even know about. Sometimes I'll be talking to a, a Bible believer or a preacher or something, and I'll say, I, I really like uh, this preacher named Bob Alexander or David Hoffman or Danny Castle or one of those guys, and they'll say, uh, I don't think I've heard of him. And those guys have been around for 40 years, and even other Bible-believing Christians or pastors don't even know they exist. This is because there is no end of all the people. I'm constantly finding out about, you know, different Bible believers that have good stuff out there, good material to 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 feed my soul with that I didn't even know existed two months ago. Because there is no end of all the people. I guarantee you that there are adult people in the United States who don't even know who the president is. I mean, especially in other countries. Do you know who the king or ruler is in all the other countries? Even though that is a very famous person, you don't even know who that is. There are people in this world who have no idea who Michael Jordan is. And the more time that passes, the more unheard of he will become. There is no end of all the people. There are so many people that the only person who could keep track of them is God himself. And the fact that there is no end of all the people shows how mighty God is. He knows how many hairs is on their head. Luke twelve seven. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. God not only knows how many people there are, he knows all their names and how many hairs is on their heads. Not only that, but there is also a bunch of angels. In Hebrews twelve twenty two. But ye are coming to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, unto an innumerable company of angels. There's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of angels, and there's a bunch of stars. Genesis 15, 5 says, And tell the stars if thou be able to number them. God said that to Abraham. Uh, in, uh, he was saying Abraham's seed was going to be at, like innumerable as the stars. There's so many stars. Not only that, but God also knows every man, not only on the planet right now, but every man who ever existed. Imagine that. There is no end of all the people. Verse 16 said, Even of all that have been before them. God knows all of them that's been before the people right now. God knows all of them and could write a book about everyone alive now and all that have been before them and say stuff about them that the person wouldn't even know about themselves. This shows you the power of God. Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So there are evil men among us. Many evil men among us. They have a master plan. They, uh, they've set themselves against the anointed. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's no need to fear because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse. And he is going to set up his kingdom, he's going to kill all the God-haters, and there's no need to fear, there's no need to worry, because the, if you read the end of the book, Jesus is on the throne, not the devil and not the evil men that walk among us.